This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is brought to you by Lexipol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexipol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Now let's get into the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzo. I am a fire lieutenant way up in uh, Wisconsin. I am also a writer for Fire Rescue One uh, and your host of this podcast for a whole year, 54 episodes. But with me along that journey is, uh, as we like to call her, the commander, the editor-in-chief of Fire Rescue One, Janelle Fasquet. Happy one-year anniversary. How are you, Janelle? I'm doing great. I'm excited to celebrate our one year anniversary today. This is great. It's uh, pretty crazy. 54 episodes. And who better to celebrate with us than our number one, Frank Lieb, who is a uh, deputy chief in FDNY. And I think most people know him by now because he's pretty much been speaking anywhere and everywhere because he's motivating and he's uh He's actually very uh, entertaining, and he's uh, he's just an all-around good guy. And the chief, you are our number one episode, and you're you're obviously one of our favorites. And now you are uh, at the end of your one, our episode number fifty-four. Chief, thanks so much for being here. Congrats on the book. Uh, did you ever think we'd make it this far? Well, could, uh, yes, I, I knew you guys were going to make it uh, to episode fifty-four. Uh, or and beyond, but um, congratulations! It's it's so hard to do anything like to do a podcast, fifty four episodes, and that's just an amazing accomplishment. And um, you guys are great together. Uh, the guests you have on, just everything, everything about the show, and I'm so happy uh, for you guys. I'm happy that the show has continued to do uh, to do well. Just really, thank you for having me on. I I appreciate. Uh, being the first guest and now back again. You know, you and I have actually, we've crossed paths quite a few times this year. You have had quite an amazing year. For our listeners that don't know you uh, very well, first of all, you've got to crawl uh, out from under the rock that you're on and and really take notice of of who um, the Deputy Assistant Chief Frank Lieb is because he's got more than 30 years experience on with FDNY. He's held several senior staff positions, including chief of uh, fire Academy, chief of training, and currently the chief of safety. Is that, that's still, still the chief of safety. That's still correct. As of uh, 0900 this morning, it was, it was still accurate. So, but uh, you know, uh, who knows by the time this uh, airs, who knows, you know, you never know. So so we'll go, we're going to stay. Yes. Still the chief of safety. Uh, You've also been a member of East Farmingdale fire department for, oh, well over 30 years since 1983. You've lectured nationally, internationally. Uh, you've been on a great panel lately uh, with Science to the Stations. We'll talk about that. Uh, but you're you're really motivated. Uh, your mission really is about keeping the fire service prepared. Uh, working on leadership, strategy, tactics, mental health. Cancer has been a, a very big initiative for you, which you've done a lot of great things with. Uh, but you also have a new book called uh, "The Cornerstones of Leadership on and Off: uh, The Lessons." learned on and off the fire ground. And I've actually been diving into this quite a bit. We'll talk a little bit about that, but um, what a great year for you. What have been the highlights so far? Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, what a ride since I was last on, on the show. So uh, um, I moved from the chief of training to the chief of safety, as, as you mentioned. So that happened uh, last year on Christmas Eve. That was when uh, it was effective Christmas Eve, and here we are a year later, and um, the book came out, um, and that came out to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the keynote uh, that I did for Firehouse Expo, um, and it's been, you know, I love the fire service and spreading the message, the good message that, that uh, um, you know, like you, you mentioned all the topics that uh, I typically speak on, um, and because it's the stuff that matters, right? It's what really matters. It's 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 what keeps our firefighters healthy and safe and, and alive. And I think um, that matters, right? And uh, I can certainly talk about engine tactics and truck tactics and all of that. And, uh, um, 
you know, leadership topics. I speak on that a lot. But um, yeah, it's the stuff that matters really to the um, to the brothers and sisters that get on the fire trucks and the ambulances. Um, and, you know, the, the book is related to while well, it talks about uh, a lot of different fire experiences I've had and different, you know, deployments to uh, Hurricane Katrina and stuff like that. Um, it's all it's timeless leadership principles that are transferable to uh, on and off the fire ground in and out of the fire service. And uh, I think that's the that's the key. That's the key part of it. Well, and it's not even the one you had. You're working on another book behind the scenes about, I think, the 30 calls that every firefighter should know or 30 fires every, every firefighter should know about. And that's what you talked to us about a year ago that you're working on that book. And then this one kind of fell in your lap and you you obviously ran with that. Are you still working on the other book? Yeah. So the 30 fires you must know, um, uh, working on that with uh, Billy Goldfeder from The Secret List and that everything's already submitted to to Penwell. Um, we anticipate that that'll be out for um, for FDIC next April, and we hope it, it's an amazing. It is an amazing, amazing uh, book, and it's thirty different fires from around the country. That um, uh, the main author for each of the chapters is somebody who has some experience, knowledge, or was at the scene. Um, of each of these different fires and they're just amazing stories uh we do an intro about the fire and then we do some what you what you should be training on um in relationship to that fire and all the proceeds that we make from that book are going to be uh, donated to a couple of different charities as well so um that's that and um i'm actually believe it or not uh, i'm working on a, another book as well and that will be in the uh, that one is titled in the mouth of the dragon um, and that is actually, that was a book that was produced in 1990. It was released in 1990, oh, yeah. two years before I went on the FDNY. Um, and I heard the, uh, the original author of it, Deborah Wallace, um, speak to a group of FDNY fire chiefs. And I immediately bought that book. And since then, I bought like a dozen copies and I give them out. And I had reached out to her a couple of months ago and I said, um, I said, I need you, I need 200 copies of this book because I was tired of paying a lot of money for them. And she goes, that can't happen. It's out of print. I said, I need you to do a second edition. She goes, that can't happen. I'm 79 years old. I said, all right, how about we co-author a book? We make it where it's more towards the firefighters. And um, she's like, I don't really have the time for this. Um, but if you're willing, I said, well, let me use six of the chapters from it. So she agreed. And she has worked so hard on this. Uh, we're probably about 75% done with the book. Um, and that that book is truly a, a labor of love to make sure that firefighters understand how how what's burning today matters from a fire dynamic standpoint and how it matters from a cancer standpoint. So the fact that um, that she was willing to to do this and the amount of work that she's putting in for, into this book so far, um, and it's going to be that will be a a fantastic book that will be geared uh, mostly for firefighters uh, and researchers in in this community. Um, but I'm super excited. I'm super excited about all three all three books, right? So most people just decide they're going to write one book if they decide they're going to write a book. Because if you would have asked me five years ago if I would ever write a book, I would have said absolutely not. Um, and here I am, you know, one book's out, one's on the way, and one's in in, uh, in 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 process. So it's really it's been quite a year or a couple couple of years. But you know what? It's been quite um, a journey in in indeed for my entire fire career, 40 years in East Farmingdale Volunteer Fire Department, where I got my start, my roots are deep there, to the 31 years in the FDNY. Um, I, I often say, love the job and it will love you back. And the job is going to fires, it's going on medical calls, it's it's the people that, you know, obviously, the you know, to me, the people are the most important part of that, but it's all about the job. And the more you put in, the more you get out, right, with, um, with different, events that you go to the training, the better trained you are. If you, if you have the privilege to rescue somebody, because it really is a, a privilege to be in that position to, to rescue somebody. So um, love the job. It'll love you back. My goodness. I love what I do. I love the fire service. I love the profession. I say there'll be a day in time when, um, when I retire from the FDNY, but I will never retire from the fire service um, because the one thing I know for sure is that I can live to be 150 years old I will never go to enough fires to satisfy my appetite to go to fires. There is nothing like that feeling 
when you're in the back, because there's nothing better than being the nozzle firefighter. When you're in the back and you hear the dispatcher saying, we're getting multiple calls, we're loading up the box, right? The officer starts banging on the back. You know you're going to work. You pull up and you're ready to go. You got everything on and you look and you see it's out a couple of windows. Every cell in your body is at a heightened awareness and you're just ready to, you're just ready to go. People jump out of airplanes. People do all sorts of different things and, and they never get to experience what we experience in those couple of seconds when we're responding and right after we arrive. There's nothing like that. And then when you have that opportunity to, uh, to hopefully rescue somebody or find somebody in a fire, because even if you find them, it doesn't mean they're going to live. In my career, I've been blessed to find two people in burning structures. And neither time, both times, they passed away. Mm -hmm. But but I gave them every opportunity. And the firefighters that were on scene gave them every opportunity to live. Um, and that's what it's about, right, is being – be better every shift, be better every day because we don't know when game day is, right, for us. But for us, we consider game day to be a working structural fire. For a civilian – a car accident is game day, right? You come for a medical call. They're not feeling good. They have chest pains. That's game day for them. And are we showing up and are we recognizing that and making sure that we're doing the absolute best job we could every time out the door? And that's hard because complacency kicks in. There's lots of reasons that that becomes difficult for us. But And how, how, do, we, how do we fight some of that back? And that's some of that's discussed in the book, as long with a lot of the skills that, that would be considered soft skills. Um, because ultimately, soft skill leadership, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of people. And think about in, in your professions, um, how many times that you have come across somebody that they are brilliant. They are brilliant tacticians at whatever they do. But boy, do they suck at their delivery. They have no people skills, they have no bedside manners, and therefore. People don't follow them the way they would if they were able to mesh everything together. Because the truly, the, the leaders that truly inspire and motivate people to greater good, to greater action, it's like a force multiplier, are the ones that understand that you got to treat your people properly. And we lose that so often. Yeah. And that's something I, that a lot of people, they're probably listening to you right now thinking, well, it's easy for you, right? It's easy for you, chief. But I, I will tell you, I've, I've, followed you around at conferences, um, you know, not stalking you. I actually introduced myself and that's how you and I met you. You now you have a crowd around you. And, but, but because you, you truly want to talk to everybody, people come up, introduce, and either, you know, them or know someone that knows them, but you, I, I, uh, I, I introduced you to Brandon, uh, Corey, and you sat down with that, that young man who had gone through a very traumatic experience and, and, you you took oh gosh an hour hour and a half with him, and I think that w that left a very very um, a positive m message to him. And now he's telling his story based on on you just giving him time. And so your passion to help build up people around you is energetic, and um, it's something that I I always uh, I'm excited to talk to you because I want to compliment you on that. I'm trying to to kind of follow in your footsteps. So, uh, so thank you for, for being that person, but I do got a, I got a bone to pick with you because we were on a committee together. We were on a panel together. You know, we were on this panel that had Gary Kirchbaum on it. It had, uh, Dr. Derek Edwards on it. Um, Lester Rich, uh, Dr. Smith, Sarah Janke, um, I'm missing, uh, John Owens was on it and I'm here, you know, just kind of grinding, just asking these great questions. And then there's you on stage throwing a baseball up kind of off in the corner there. So I got to ask you what was going on there. Well, so I'm just, um, well, first off, I was listening. You were asking a question at the time and I was intently listening to the question uh, and just, you know, having a little soft horse for myself. And I think about, so uh, Bartolo Colon, the retired baseball player, the pitcher, uh, he would, uh, on the mound in pressure situations, he would just toss the ball to himself. And I, I think about like, that was how he, you know, mental performance, he would calm himself down and get back into the moment and uh, center himself. And um, I guess maybe I was doing that, but you, you gave me the ball, right? So I, I didn't drop the ball when you threw it to me. And I, I, I didn't drop it when I was having the soft toss. And then um, I tossed it into the, 
into the audience to uh, Tim Graves from the New York State Office of Fire Prevention and Control, um, who, by the way, Tim was just given an award for his work uh, with New York State and, and his cancer awareness and cancer preven prevention. So he didn't drop the ball either, as uh, none of us on the stage uh, did, and neither did you with all the great questions and the moderation that you did uh, for that panel. And I have to give credit. Uh, the picture was taken by uh, Jessica Siders, who is uh, uh, my girlfriend, and, and she's very talented as a photographer. So for her to capture that moment was great. But the panel itself, we had a great conversation just about building, you know, the optimal fire department and, and what goes into that, you know, from the mental health standpoint, from the cancer standpoint, from the leadership standpoint, all these things that you've been very instrumental in speaking about uh, throughout the years. Um, and, and of course, what you, you really touch on in this book. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the book. The, the one thing that, that I had heard about was your dedication to your brother in this book. And um, can I ask, you know, a little bit about what, what was your relationship with him? And is that where a lot of this drive comes from with you? So all of my drive comes, all of my drive for the fire service comes from my brother. He, when you talk about training lineage and, and where you are in the fire service and where you came from. So my earliest memories in the fire service are when I was seven years old. Um, and that was when my brother joined the East Farmingdale Volunteer Fire Department. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And he would bring me up there and everything I learned about the fire service early on um, was from him. And the only other thing I wanted to be for a short period of time was I wanted to be a digger man. And that was because they were ripping up the street in front of my house. I was the only one that was happy that they were ripping up the street in front of my house. Is but that then, the guy who drives like the, the bulldozer? Yes, that's right. So the bulldozer, the bucket load, all of that. So um, I got a ride in the bucket loader. The guy's like, you want a ride? And I'm like, oh, man. And I think about like, because that guy could, that driver of that truck realized how enamored I was in what they were doing, right? All these earth movers. And then I was able to get a ride. And I think about when somebody visits, when someone visits the fire house, right? Do we, do we, do we do that? Do we make sure that every single time that a civilian comes into the firehouse, that a kid comes in, right? You talk about recruitment, right? You know, when it, oh, no, we're too busy right now, or it's lunchtime. And the, the, the young, the young boy or girl just wants to go on the fire truck. Right. Because they remember that stuff forever. Um, and whether they become the next mayor, you know, one day mayor of your city or they become a, a council person or they become, uh, you know, they want to become on the fire department. Right. I mean, you think about the benefits of, of making sure that we're engaged with our public. Right? Be nice. Right. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's uh, in so many regards. It's it's you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty simple. And on that panel, actually, Dr. Uh, Denise Smith said, was telling a story about, I think, one of her young grandchildren that that all they want to do is see the fire truck and the impact that we can have on that that one particular person. But we got to take advantage of that. Right. And yeah. that's exactly what you're saying is have the right attitude to take advantage of it. Now, your brother took advantage of that. He showed you around the fire service. And then and, and that's kind of what what propelled you to, to continually just advance your career throughout, correct? 30 yeah. Uh, so when I'm 17 years old, I wind up. So when I'm 14, I joined the junior fire department. At 17, I become a, you know a full fledged regular firefighter. Um, and I remember my one of my first fires I had with him and this other guy, Mike Kilbridge, who's an ex chief in my fire department today, and uh, who's a fire in a commercial establishment. Um, I was nervous, and they weren't. They were joking around, and and they I had the nozzle. They were backing me up in the officer and. They just talked me through the fire. And the next thing you know, you know, I look back and like I, I knew it was all about teamwork then. Right. Because I was part of their team. But I look back and look at the mentorship that that uh, that my brother had on me, that my coverage had on me. And so many other of these people in my department, seeing some of the chiefs um, at the time and, and some of the rules that they put that they put through to make sure that the training standards matched the, you know, uh, the current environment. And they took a lot of heat for changing because they had raised the bar of training and they took some heat about that. And I've, I've never forgotten that, um, you know, that Charlie Crimmy, uh, Greg James and Joe Riley, those, those three guys and some of the training level that they put through, um, they, that's the standard that we still have today for our training. And, you know, we shouldn't be lowering the bar, right. But we should be keeping it, keeping it high. And I, I say, you know, show your people you care for them and you love them by having a standard, having a bar, hold them accountable because that's what they want and that's what they need. Um, have a leadership in any in any capacity. Just uh, 
what is expected of me? And tell me where that bar is. And, and the high achievers, those that are into it, will excel. But it also makes sure that those that maybe aren't into it as much, well, they have a, a legitimate standard that they're going to be held accountable for as well. So I think that benefits uh, everybody. Uh, and but then I go on in my career and I get on to the FDNY. And, and when I'm 26, my brother passes away. And my greatest mentor was gone. And um, this book is dedicated to him. And um, my thesis when I went to the Naval Postgraduate School, um, you know, I wrote about a topic I didn't know a lot about. And that was out of hospital cardiac arrest. And my thesis um, was the first thing in that I um, dedicated to my brother. Um, because bystander CPR um, and people knowing how to do CPR, even if it's hands only, um, saves lives. And more people need to do that because the first first responders are the people who witness a cardiac arrest. And people need to know that, right? That we we all can be um, can be first responders and we can all impact in a positive way uh, society and those that, that are part of society. Is there still part of, there's a part of him still with you which like you said, oh god yeah oh yeah yeah which makes you yeah. kind of who you are and and there, i'm sure there's days that you don't want to read or you don't want to write is that what helps you say hey this is it's bigger than me i think it's a, so that's a great that's a great question and a great point right so um it's definitely bigger than all of us and um i, I just think you know you are um you are a collection of all of your experiences, whatever your experiences are, right? That's what makes each of us unique is that none of us have the same exact life experiences. And they all, we bring that together, we mold it into the, what, the, what's the type of person that we that we wanna be. And, you know, every day you're picking from from something or learning something to be, to be the, you know, the better version, right? Hopefully you're not the same version, right? None of us are the same version we were one year ago when we did episode number one, right? Um, you know, that would be a, that would be a failure, an individual failure, if if we couldn't say I'm I'm better in 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 many ways than the person that was in episode one, right? For for all of us, I would think it's you know that's that's the goal, right? Is to to keep moving forward, pushing the ball down the road, being better, and making people around you better. All, all of that, I think that that's important. And that's I think that's probably why we're still here. That's why that's why you're super fired up to come talk to us and why we're super fired to have you. Now, the, there's stickers that come with a book and it, the sticker says this is the blank way. And you you in the book mentioned that this is the FDNY way, but but it's a blanket statement. Right. Like when when you you want people to fill this out and with the idea of what? Yeah. So even on the back of the book, right, it has an area where you could do that. So, um, you know, where that's what it's about, because it's, you know, um, it's about so for me, it's about the FDNY way. It's also about the East Farmingdale way. It's about the Frank way. Right. It's about all those things. So it could be the Janelle way. Right. But it doesn't the fire rescue one way. They, it's all of that because, you know, the FDNY is steeped in tradition. It's steeped in culture um you know we our training culture extinguishment culture search culture safety culture all of these things right and they they are the fdny way but those are also you know and and you could add any of those anything else that you want what is your way right what is what is your personal mission statement right and that is you know that's the aaron way that's the front whatever that per, you know is that's you know that's that's what that is but you could put anything on that line that makes it where you know because the fdny when i'm at work the fdny is the greatest organization on the planet when i'm in east farmingdale east farmingdale is the greatest organization on the planet when i'm whatever company i'm in is the greatest company on the job and that's a mindset that's a, a mindset it's a winning mindset and i think if you just remember that and, and keep it where that positive mindset that knows that you know uh, you're going to have off days, but we're going to push back complacency. We're going to try and make ourselves better. And if you, I think if you continue to do that, you'll be good. And, you know, I got that from my brother and, I, I, and as, as my early mentor and my parents, of course. Uh, but I spent a lot of time with my brother. And when I look at even my training lineage and you look at where we come from and where we're going. Um, and I say, you, you know, the more connections you have the more children you have. So think about in your 54 episodes, how many people are now related to you 
because you're now part of their training lineage. Uh, and you think about who mentored you and who mentored your mentor. So I think about my brother and then, you know, as he's a direct descendant in my training lineage, so is my coverage. And you think who mentored those people? And I asked this question to Tom Richardson, the recently retired chief of department for, for the FDNY, who I'm good friends with now. And he made me one of the charter members of the uh, when he was forming Squad 270. And I asked him how he chose the people that he picked for the company and where he learned that from. And he said, you had to have some skill, but you also had to have heart. And I said, where'd you learn that from? And he said, well, John Vigiano was my mentor. And I'm like, of course he was. This guy was legendary in the FDNY. But then I think, who was John Vigiano's mentor? And where does that go back? And you could trace this back. If this was ancestry, and you think about all the different connections, right? So we talked about be nice and some of that stuff. Well, that's Alan Brunacini, right? So you think, so I have a direct connection to Alan Brunacini. I have a direct connection to, to you guys, both being on the show, but also listening to other episodes and learning from them. So those are all different training lineage. So you wind up with all these children because those are all people that have that are descendants of you from the show. And then all the people below you that are the roots of you that bring you back. And you think, boy, that we're probably related somehow to Ben Franklin. Right? Somewhere in our family tree, if we were to put this all out, um, and it's, you know, uh, it's really remarkable the more you think about that. So when we say we stand on the shoulders and the giants of those that came before us, that is literally true. Because it is the giants that we stand on the shoulders of because we don't stand on the shoulders of the slugs. Because whoever taught you anything in that you're thinking of when I said, well, who's your training lineage? Who taught you? You're not thinking of slugs. You're thinking of people that were very high performers that taught you. So slugs kill the family tree, which kills culture, which kills all of those good things. So we need to have as many children as possible in a training sense of the word. To make sure that we outnumber the slugs. slugs. I, I think it's so, like the timing is perfect that you're saying this because we have an article coming out literally today from Chief Jason Coy out of Wyoming where he talks about perspective and he talks about these lineages. And now if you think about what we, who and where we learn, how it can probably be traced back to Ben Franklin. But if you're only on a single, you know, you learn from one person who learned from one person before them, who learned from one person before them, it can become a very narrow focused perspective and how branching out, learning from a network of people creates a much fuller person with so much more depth and experience and a greater perspective and going, creating these like large networks and lineages and it's just, I mean, it's like aligns perfectly with what you just said. I'll and they're enormous, there. right? So our lineages are, are enormous. If you're into the job, especially today, right? With all the podcasts, with all the all the books, all the um, audio books, whatever, right? YouTube, there's so many different ways to, to learn and grow your lineage um, that it's remarkable. And I speak about that chapter 14 of the book is titled Training Lineage. Um, and I think it's it's important that we understand um that portion of it because when it's not just paying lip service to you know to those that came before us it's it is literally the um the success of your organization depends on the training of your organization the heart and soul of every organization on the planet is training it's training and education because without that um you can't do anything right so if someone wasn't able to put the internet together that enables us to do this podcast right it's simply it It'd be three individuals talking on their own, but all of the ability you go into the supermarket and the, the checkout clerk knows how to knows what knows what he or she is doing. Otherwise, you would never be able to leave the store. So it's everything that education and training is the heart and soul of every organization in the fire service. It's often a matter of life and death. Um, so there's even a little bit more importance on it on what we do. Um, because lives could be um, saved or lost based on our ability to know what we're doing. Would you say too for organizations that want to start changing their culture and making it more positive? That's one of the first things to do is just start to branch out. Because I think you and I had conversations before about some organizations they just stay within, they don't look outside. So how can you really grow when you're not 
looking out, right? Well, you certainly you have to widen aperture, right? So if if I do the same exact episode, if I do the same exact uh, exercise every single day, if all I'm doing is bicep curls, I'm gonna have very big bi biceps, right? Although it doesn't, it seems like no matter how many bicep curls I do, my biceps don't get bigger. But that's a whole nother topic. But if I work out, if you work out all the different muscle groups, right, you're gonna you're gonna get better, right? You'll get bigger expand the things that we're talking about so when when you're just very narrow and you don't widen that aperture to look to look um both internal at who who you have within your department and what, how it can be better but also look at what how others are doing it you know uh, you should not i don't care what you do you shouldn't be um insular in what you do because then you you're only limited on 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 what your people are telling you and there's there's a lot of good ideas in every profession outside of outside of your company or outside of um, your fire department or whatever that is that uh, you know organization that we're talking about. Well, your analogy with the biceps is you get big biceps, but that doesn't transfer to better performance. It just transfers to you know bigger biceps. And I think this leads into what Colin Powell said. And you 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 listed this in the in the book, which I love. I love Colin Powell. I love uh, his book and what his message was and. And he says in here, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is the slogan of the complacent, the arrogant, or the scared. It's an excuse for inaction, a call to non-arms. And, and I think that's a great segue into organizations need to take heed of this, right, in order to grow. If they're not doing that, like, what's the first step? What I think you kind of, you, you hit on it a little bit, but like, give me a little more... Uh, kind of a, a, a framework for what those organizations need to do. Yeah. So, you know, I consider the FDNY uh, a high reliable organization, right? So we track small failures. We look at, we look at everything, right? So if we, we, we make sure that we're evaluating the process that we didn't get lucky for the outcome. So I think we want to make sure um, that by, by doing that and, and see um, if we stress something out and it breaks, well, maybe we need to reevaluate that or realize that that we didn't get to that just because we got lucky that time. And maybe we got lucky five times in a row that we make sure that we are constantly looking at all of those little things and making sure that we are doing the best we can. And I, I say often we can fool the spectators, but we can't fool the players um, and just make sure that that, you know, if it's not broke, are we stressing it enough to, to, you know, is that procedure, is that process reliable at the end of the, at the end of the day? And Colin Powell, I mean, you know, you talk about his leadership and and uh, and what he's uh, talk talks about. Uh, I mean, how, who doesn't love a nice quote from from him? Very, very, um, ed such an educated man, but he was just a great communicator, you know. And his whole thing about, yeah, you know, it, it might have worked this time, but does that mean it's going to work the next time? And like you said, continually evaluate it. In your book, you talk about the escalator, which I love that story. I think we actually talked about that in the first episode, uh, you know, the target, the Macy's and, and then challenging mm -hmm. your, your people. And, and that kind of gets me to the next point. Like there are so many big points in this book. But if you were to take and say, hey, here are my three favorite or, or my three favorite chapters in this. What are they? Oh, wow. Um... I thoroughly enjoyed writing this book because it enabled me to really internalize and and uh, and make sure that I was pulling the right messages out of some of my experiences. And I think about how the organization, how my organization has grown um, just in terms of what we do with our counseling service units and how and how we how we are nowadays. And I, I in the book, I talk about uh, responding to a plane crash in the in the Rockaways uh, shortly after September 11th, and the numbness I felt, and then we went back and we basically we were just on our own, um, you know. And the next day we're down at the Trade Center site again, and I, you know, to to fast forward to the Twin Parks fire where you know 17 civilians, um, you know, perished in that in in that in that building. And our chief of department, while he was responding to that, he responded on the fifth alarm, Tom Richardson, and he called our counseling unit. And we made sure that we had counselors on the scene while our people were still there, making sure that everybody, you know, that everybody was okay. And, you know, 
the counselors even asked me. I got a phone call from one of the counselors even the next day after the Twin Parks fire. And I just think about how that simply wasn't the case in 2001 after we went to that plane crash and I went home and was, was you know, I felt largely on my on my own. Um, I think the, the chapter on the response to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, I mean, the, the, the just... I'm t- I'm still in awe of the um, the New Orleans Fire Department firefighters and their resiliency and their ability to continue to work. In some cases, when they their homes were destroyed or their families were somewhere else, and the pride that they had in in their organization and in their f- and in themselves, and it was um, remarkable. Um, my favorite chapter to write uh, had to be the one. Um, when I dressed up as uh, as the mascot, as uh, as hot dog for the Columbus Day Parade, um, you know, just the lessons learned. And I think the 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 salient lesson in that is, you know, don't expect don't expect your people to do something you wouldn't do yourself. And um, I needed to experience that. And uh, after I did that, the there was another the civilian leader um, of the unit. He dressed up, Fabricio Caro, he dressed up as hot dog um, for an event that we did uh, at Fox 5. We did a media event that I was at, and very few people knew that he was actually the unit, the unit head, the civilian director of the unit was hot dog for that. And no one knew that. And those were um, so enthusiastic leadership um, is contagious and it spreads to your team. Uh, Everybody wants to be part of a winning team. And a winning team begins with a winning mindset and taking care of your people. And when you do that, every single firehouse that I've ever worked in, and when I went to the fire academy and at training, and even when I went to safety, I've always had people that contacted me that said, I want to come work for you. And I think they, so they believe in me. Um, Perhaps more importantly, they believe in the mission. Um, And they know that if you work for me, I'm going to support you. I'm going to give you the tools that you need. I'm not going to micromanage you. Um, and if you're if you're a high performer, you will excel in that environment. And that's the key. And that's how you draw quality people to any organization that you're part of. I don't micromanage my team. Um, I give you enough direction for you to do the job in the best way that you want to do it. And then if you screw it up, then that's a different story. Then I might have to put some guardrails on you. But until that point, I trust you until you tell me I shouldn't or I believe in you. But, you know, uh, that is so, so rarely the case. You know, firefighters are amazing people. You give them the instruction, you tell them what you want to do. I've almost, almost every single time I have been blown away by the results of what I give my team to do. And, and I wind up, it's, it's funny because as the leader, I wind up getting the credit and I'm always trying to, it's, this had nothing to do with me. I told them, this is what I want to done. And and they far in a way blew blew away what what I was thinking. For you personally, when you started to understand how empowering people, how, how powerful that is, let's say you give someone a task. Were you ever challenged with, oh, maybe that's not the way I would do it? And and I I can say like, you know, I've witnessed and me personally, like I I'm trying to learn through your wisdom and step back and say. Here's the task. You guys do it. As long as it's safe, maybe you're, you're going to teach me a new way to do it. What, I guess, what suggestion, rec- recommendation would you have for someone who's just right away you give an assignment and if it's not the exact way you would do it, they step in? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so a lot of that is going to hinge on how much experience they have, how much time, right? So, um, and, that, and that's going to hinge on how much direction you need to give them. So if I was telling if I was telling a new firefighter that I wanted him to go do a task, um, I might give him a little bit more direction on how I think it should be done. But ultimately, it's going to be his responsibility to ensure the task is done. Um, but so a lot of that is within procedures if we're on the fire ground. But if I'm giving him another task, say, around the firehouse or, you know, probably a good example is when I was at uh, the fire academy, we, we built we built this structure, the Proby Pavilion. And I basically told the team I want the structure. I told them the size that I wanted it to be and that I, I wanted it to have a back wall because so, that's where we're going to put a TV so we can do some instruction. And they went, they just 
did they put so many extras on this? The, the thing is beautiful. Now this structure is beautiful. But if I would have gave them, if I would have gave specifics on what I want, I would have had a very plain uh, structure. It didn't have a lot of stuff, and that you know a lot of the different extras that it has um, in it. And it, they did an absolutely amazing job. But it's by just giving them the enough enough direction. And I think you know the 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 more experience you have. If you take a 10-year firefighter and you're telling him that you want a task done, a task that he should know on the fire ground, right? Now, he may take his path to get there, right? He needs to get to the roof. He's going to figure out the best way. But if I got to sit there and just and give him every single step, then something's wrong with my training, right? That I haven't preloaded all of this into that firefighter. Because the greatest resource that we have on the fire ground is a thinking, well-trained, physically fit firefighter. You know, it's why I don't legislate everything on the fire ground in our procedures, because when you do that, you create robots. I don't want robots. I want people that understand the why, can operate in the gray area and get the job done, period. I want it to be done safely. And that's why I say, uh, you know, a safe firefighter is an aggressive firefighter, is the great resource on the fire ground, because, you know, um, the idea is we do want to go home. At, we do want to go home at the end of our tour. Um, and we want to save every life that we possibly can. And there's a way to do that. Um, and that's being safe and aggressive. But it, it starts with knowing what the heck you're doing. Right? And that, If you that know what you're doing, with, it matters. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like what you were saying about standard. You have to set that that bar. Because otherwise people are going to do it. But that's that's everything from this is what our expectation is on particular tasks. Right? That goes down to policy. But someone someone's going to take it to the next level and possibly become more efficient with it, safer with it. Um, but if you're not setting that bar, that's when you start to have these issues from what I'm, from what I, I'm, I'm hearing from you and that that's so, why it's super important to communicate them and set that. Yeah. And, and, and again, the more, you know, right. So this, the, the firefighter has some more time, he's going to understand things a little bit differently. So when we say, you know, and love you ask a firefighter, hey, are you are you aggressive? You know, or they're just, or they're just saying I'm an aggressive firefighter. Oh yeah. So what does that drop in neutral plane mean? The, the neutral plane is that is all the way down. What does that mean? Like so, and they say, and they don't know, right? So you're telling me an aggressive firefighter. Well, but you don't even know that that low neutral plane. You better check underneath you, or that we may get, it's dropping quickly that we may get a flashover. So you're an aggressive firefighter, but you're not going to be an effective firefighter. Unless you know what you're doing. That's why I say a, a safe firefighter is an aggressive firefighter. Because there's so many hints and clues that you need to understand on the fire ground. So you could be that aggressive, smart firefighter. That is that by nature of that definition is also a safe firefighter. So um, they there's, they all should be coexisting, commingling in there. That's what, uh, that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah, Chief Fennessy was on and said, I don't want rule followers. I, I, they get stuck and can't think on their feet. I want those people that we give them that training and then they can, they can make the educated decisions from there based off of that. And well, so, so and Chief, Chief Fennessy's right. So it's, yeah. you need to know the procedures to break the procedures, but it's, it's understanding when to operate in that gray area. That's understanding that why. So that's why if, if if I'm legislating everything on the fire ground, then you're not going to make those changes that, oh, my goodness, what do we do here? This isn't in the books. No, that, that, that doesn't work. Oh, my goodness. In 2022, I went to at least four fires that I had never gone to a similar fire in my life. And I have 40 years in the volunteers and 31 in New York City. And I went to four different fires off the top of my head. That's just four different fires. Forget about different scenarios where maybe you saw fire spread or something, something unique that maybe you haven't seen. But um, so I say, you know, stay learnable, uh, have a beginner's mindset, make sure that you are engaged in what we're doing, because um, there's always something new to, to learn to be better. Always. And that's where your tips and training come in. By the way, I've, I've used those quite a few. I know you did one on the crane fire that you had. Um, I've read I, I read the one that you did on the the, the escalator and I, I love that idea. I think every single fire department should be doing that. When you experience a call, you see something that maybe someone else needs to know. It's just a one pager that you 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 write up. Are you still doing those? 
Yes, we're still doing those. I'm still involved with those, the tips from training and safety. Um, so you mentioned the one with the tower crane that was on fire, right? So fun fact is we've, we had never had a tower crane on fire. So I was not there, but the command post, the members that were running the fire probably had 200 years of collective experience and not one of them had ever responded to a crane that was on fire. But yet each of them was able to draw on their experiences, their training, to come up with a solution to solve the problem at hand because they understood the why, they understood the gray areas, and understood how to put all of that together, to mesh it together, to come up with a solution to the problem at hand. Because we couldn't legislate that because we can't, we wouldn't have even thought of that. And that that brings me to my next question. What are you what are you experiencing now and that you you want people to to make note of? You're kind of looking at what's the next training thing? I know lithium ion batteries are really big in New York and that you guys are really leading the uh, kind of education train on that. What else do you see coming? Oof. Yeah. So what's over the horizon, right? That is always the, uh, the $10,000 question. And we, we're not very good at seeing what's over the horizon. I think as we transition to a society that is all battery powered, um, with cars and fire trucks and trains and boats, and as you know, we're only going to see more of this, this green technology is going to continue to evolve. Um, some of the rules on, on what you could put on roofs, is going to make it where um, we're not going to cut nearly as many roofs as, as we have in the past um, because you're not going to be able to cut some of these green roofs, uh, especially some of them that now have to have vegetation on them. So I think there's changes with that, vegetation, solar panels, all of that. Uh, energy storage systems are going to uh, continue to be a problem and, and possibly a greater problem because uh, all of this green power needs to be stored. So as we move towards all of these different alternate sources of energy they're all going to need to be kept because whether it's wind or whether it's solar right they're dependent on either wind or the sun so they have to be stored that way we could have continuous power um you know and then what else is that you know it's uh it's just it's crazy what uh you know what will be the next the next greatest the great technology that comes along but I think as we continue, I think the green initiatives are going to uh, largely be what keeps fire chiefs up um, for the next, you know, up at night for the next 20 years or so. And we got to make sure we're doing all we can to best protect our members from from cancer and, and all of those things. I think that's still um, we're still not doing enough uh, for our people uh, to make sure that we're we're getting there. There's still departments that are negligent in what they're doing or not doing. What's your big mission right now? I mean, you you get you hit, you have your hands in so many different things, but you know, as far as let's say when we come bring you back on next year, because I I'd like to still be around <laughs> next year with this podcast and bring you on for episode uh one hundred eight yeah one hundred something. No, I got to come back on for one hundred. <laughs> all right, all right, Janelle, book it. Um, yeah, you know what what um where would you like to be a year from now? Oh boy, that's um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I would like to have all three of the books. You know, the one book is out. All three of them are out. Um, maybe uh, maybe retired from the FDNY by then. That's a that's a possibility. Um, and just continuing to spread the positive message um, because I think we need to collectively speak and be pushing the topics that matter um, for the, it's always all about, in the fire service, it's always all about the men and women that get on the fire trucks and get on the ambulances. And we must never, ever forget that. Um, if every single thing we're not doing is geared towards um, making those folks be able to save more lives, um, you know, cause that's what we're doing, right? So we're, I, I say it in, in my position, when I'm not responding to a fire, I am support personnel, um, uh, whether I'm chief of safety, training, fire academy. I'm in a support role to make those people that are in a response capability, in a response mode, I'm supporting them. And when I'm responding, I expect others to be supporting the mission that I'm doing because none of us would be here if we weren't responding. So we must never forget that. It doesn't matter what position you are in the organization. 
You are there because it's our job to respond to emergencies. If we took away that responsibility, no one else would be needed. We wouldn't have a job. No we wouldn't one have would a job. Have yep. No one would have the job. So everybody is in support of the mission. And the mission is the men and women that are getting, getting on the fire trucks and ambulances. And that's the, if you're not getting on a fire truck or an ambulance, um, then, then you're in a support role. And understand that and do the best you can to make it where those folks can save um, and make life better for those that we are sworn to serve and protect. And that you also were touching on why it's so important for the next generation to get involved nationally, like with the NFPA, with the um, National Fire Academy. Um, talk just real briefly on what you would like to see more for, you know, kind of that middle to next generation. Yeah, so I, I think it's critical for this generation, for, for our generation, right, of us older firefighters or fire officers, right, that we need to get the next generation involved, perhaps sooner in their career than we were. Um, I've been fortunate that at the, uh, uh, the U.S. Fire Administrator has had two summits, uh, once in 2023 and once in 2022, and I've been fortunate to speak at both of them. Um, and um, those are 30,000 foot topics, right? The uh, you talk about a wide aperture. That's great. I think we need to bring in other topics that that uh, that matter to the five and ten year firefighter, right? Um, wildland and and the interface and cancer and mental health. Those are all important topics, right? They're critically important as that overarching theme. But for the firefighter, how do we get them interested in that? Well, if we want them to watch this, pro, you know, if we want them to watch the summit and learn about these topics, we need to sprinkle in the M&Ms. We need to sprinkle in the topics that are important to those firefighters. And perhaps one of those topics would be talking about the firefighter rescue, you know, the rescue survey, right? There's been, you know, the group that's doing that, they've documented more than 3,000 um, rescues. Uh, and that's not even including the data from the FDNY because there's no, that's just a group of dedicated firefighters that have put this together. But maybe that should be a national program where it has national funding. And we look at not only civilian deaths, but how many civilians are we saving in fires? Because in the FDNY, we save lives almost every single day. We pull people out of burning buildings. Um, and I don't, and we celebrate that on social media, but that's not celebrated in a, in a national way. And perhaps it should, where we, we track civilian deaths, but what about civilian saves, right? Because they're important, they're important as well. So if we talk about if we add some of these topics to the to the summit and sprinkle some of those M&Ms in, right, it's like trail mix, right? Um, when you eat trail mix, my favorite trail mix is just a bag of plain M&Ms. Um, <laughs> uh, Chief, they don't call that trail mix. They call that just a bag of M&Ms. Yeah. Just, just, just <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so if I have trail mix, the point is I want to add more M&Ms, right? Because when you, <laughs> when you take a handful of trail mix, right? And you have extra M&Ms, you're like, oh, this is awesome. I got lots of M&Ms. Where if you pull up, if you get a, a handful and there's no M&Ms, you're like, this is terrible. So we need to sprinkle in more M&Ms. And what, one of my most recent articles for Firehouse Magazine talks about adding, adding M&Ms. And, and basically, that's when I, when I talk about almost any topic. But specifically, if I'm talking about cancer, I was talking to Gary Kirschbaum from the, from the well, from the NFFF now, mm -hmm. um, and I was frustrated that when I would do a, a class on just cancer, you wouldn't you wouldn't get a full house, right? But if I was to do a class on fire dynamics or engine operations, the class is full, standing room only. So now what I started doing is I talk about both of them, and I combine them. So I'm going to talk about fire dynamics, and I'm going to you know so I'm going to talk about cancer, and then sprinkling the M and M's, the M and M's is the tactics, is the other stuff. That's what young firefighters want to come into. And I think about when I was a 10-year firefighter, like if I had a choice, I'm going to go to a class on fire dynamics or cancer, I'm not going to a cancer class. Right now, I want to learn tactics. There's so much that the young firefighter has to learn. I don't expect them to be in that class. So what we need to start doing is sprinkling some of those, some of those things and making sure that there's enough M&Ms to keep the firefighter interested but there's also enough granola bar in their granola in that trail mix because that's what's going to keep them healthy for the long term, right? 
Immediate energy M&Ms, that's delicious, that's great, but these other things are going to keep you healthy as well. And when I started doing that, immediately those classes that had cancer stuff in it and also spoke about fire dynamics were standing room only. Just from that little change in how we teach. So no matter what topic you're teaching, sprinkle in some of the granola into your classes that are all M&Ms. And if you're teaching a class that's all granola, sprinkle in some M&Ms. So that way we get a well-rounded firefighter that eats a well-balanced diet instead of just working out his biceps or her biceps. Or just eating the M&Ms. Or just eating the M&Ms, which we all love. Yes. Right. And those yep. classes are always standing room only. But we need to make sure that we are that we are um, giving our firefighters um, a not only a tasty snack, but also a nutritious snack. And that is done by combining some of these other these other things in it. And you don't even if you're talking about stretching a hose line, you don't have to add a lot of different things about cancer or other stuff. Just put enough in there where there's an awareness. You know, yeah. that our firefighters, you know, is maybe to learn two or three things on that topic. I think every, every single thing should have something on cancer, should have something on just fitness and, and health, like, you know, stretching a hose line. Well, Hey, you, you have to be physically fit and ready in order to do that. So I think all these things it, you're hitting it right on the head that when we can start to combine all these different messages, we're going to make a better impact. Yeah. And yeah, a physically fit firefighter stretches, you know, Stretches the line well. A physically fit fire, you know, a, a firefighter doesn't, you know, he doesn't touch his ho the hose with bare hands. All these different uh, things. So it's, uh, yeah, it's. We could do it. We just got to start somewhere, and that's why I, you know, I wrote that article and the science to the station keynote that I did a couple weeks ago. Um, that was the title, right? It was adding M the the trail mix approach to fire to teaching firefighter cancer. Um, and I think about that all the time. Um, oftentimes, the fire, you know, firefighters love M and M's. Make sure we're adding enough M and M's into everything we're doing. And sometimes the firefighters are the M and M's. They need to have a seat at the table with a lot of these things as well. So um, I love that analogy. And who doesn't love M and M's? Well, Chief, I think you and I should do one together. You should talk about fire tactics and and um, you know, uh, it, you know, fire advancement, hose line advancement. I could come in and just piggyback on that with the fitness side of it so i'm i'm for those that want us um we can be booked janelle is going to take the bookings on this but i think that's that's would be a great one uh we can even be sponsored by m and i don't care but i just that's, why not yes some health and <laughs> fitness stuff in there with it um, uh, you know chief thank you so much uh congrats on the book you are uh, a true champion for the fire service uh, but we're not done with you yet by the way we have uh we have to put you back on the hot seat and janelle uh, has some great ones for you today and i actually have a special surprise for you on one of them but um we're gonna let janelle uh, start with them all right all right chief i was i'm curious to know from the process of writing the three books if there's a single moment that stands out to you of any of an epiphany that you may have had while writing the books something that you thought, wow, it took me writing three books to realize that one thing. Yeah, that's a great question. And there's just two things, right? And the one I spoke about already is connecting the dots from the mental health on how much we've changed. We've heard about it, but then I actually saw it firsthand. Uh, and the second, the second is we spoke about it as well. And it's the training lineage. And I was having this conversation with my son about that we stand on the, you know, because he's heard me say that, that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it was connecting that in an Ancestry.com way, right, on how on how that is. And I think about, like, my sister does Ancestry for a whole family, and she can do the whole tree. And if we could do that, and when you start asking people who their, who their mentors were, and, and you're, if you could go back and find out who their mentor was, it's just, it's fascinating. And I wish we could do that for, for several generations. And I would say... Uh, Certainly for this book, that was the biggest one. For the 35, as you must know, it was learning so much more about fires that I didn't know about, uh, that I, I thought I knew everything about this fire, but now I heard it from a different version. And others, so you mentioned um, uh, Brandon Corey earlier, right? So I met him because of you. Yep. Um, and his story is one of the 30, which yeah. that simply would not have happened 
had it not been for for you introducing me to him so just things like that and that book that that book could have been 90 fires you must know or even more because there's there's so many fires that we should all know about and you know and this will give you a consolidated version of that so i think for that just blown away at at the stories of of others seeing it through a different lens that you may have maybe you read about it from the incident commander standpoint and now you're going to hear about it from the person who was the irons firefighter on the first two um and it's just it's different you know and the way the way line of duty deaths in particular how they impact so many people um not just the families but so many but so many other people and you know so we owe it to ourselves we owe it to our loved ones to be better every day and to make sure that we are making ourselves um, difficult to injure and impossible to kill. And that comes through training, through training, through training, through our dedication to knowing our job and knowing what we're doing. And, you know, we will lose people in our profession, unfortunately, anyway. But we have to make sure that we put the odds in our favor to the greatest possible extent that we can. And again, we owe that to ourselves and to those that that rely on us and love us, our, our families. So I think, and I'm still learning so much from the third book. I'm not even gonna, uh, you know what? On the hundredth episode, I'll be able to answer that. Uh, I'll be able to answer the question based on that book, but that's a pretty good question. Sounds good. I'm gonna make a note now to uh, come back to that. Yeah. Well, Chief, last episode, our, well, our first episode, the last one we did together, you said, hey, I, I think everybody should take 10 minutes and read something about fire. So I've been doing that. I've now completed five books this year. Thank you for that. So give me another tidbit, uh, a 30 second, um, you know, bit of information and tip that I can use for the next, uh, you know, year going forward. Oof. Learn something from everyone you meet. Sometimes you learn what not to do. I'm sure I mentioned that in the first one. And I think that's the challenge, right, is, is making sure that you're learning what you should be learning and not, you know, not learning something. How do you di differentiate from, all right, I'm learning what not to do here. So sometimes you don't know it's what it's not something you shouldn't be doing. And I think about a fire I had where I didn't wear, I didn't have my ear flaps down and I, and I burnt my ears, one of my first fires. And it was because somebody had told me, you want to put your flaps up because you want to feel the heat. And the next thing you know, my ears are burnt. And I'm thinking, wow, that was poor advice. So, um, yeah and uh just believe in the people be positive about your people that would be another one for you be positive because um rely on your team i mean it's amazing what your team will do for you when you uh you know when you allow them to when you encourage them to and you you create the right environment for them i'm gonna do it outstanding all right chief let's have a little fun if you could teleport yourself <clears throat> anywhere right now, modern day, where would you go? Wow. I always, uh, I always say there's no place better than where I am currently, wherever that is. I'm where, I, I'm where I'm meant to be. Um, so where would I be right now? That's a good question. I got to come up with it. I got to come up with some answer for you. Right? Maybe at the me. bar because your wife is waiting for you. You're on vacation yeah, so, doing this you know, podcast. Would, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so I would be. It would be somewhere where I'm visiting somebody that I haven't seen in a while. Right, visiting family. Uh, we have family all over the country, um, so I always love that. So it's not really a, a great answer, but it's. Um, I, I would be somewhere visiting family that that I haven't seen um, in a while because sometimes we forget to to stop and enjoy the enjoy the journey and make sure that you are seeing the people that that matter most to you and spending time with them work-life balance um yeah so yeah so no specific place just with people that i care for uh, i have to get a prop for this next question hold on one second <laughs> oh boy oh i'm nervous now yeah you and me both <laughs> unless he's putting on a tigger costume or something i you know you never you never better know. be that better be it oh my god <laughs> 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 he 
<laughs> you did it. Oh my gosh. Oh, of course. Oh my goodness. You're good, man. You're good. Chief, if you could be a cartoon character, who would you be and why? Tigger, because he's the only one. And because he happens to be the same age as me. Uh, um, oh my goodness. For our listeners who are not watching this, Aaron <laughs> literally just in a nanosecond put on a Tigger costume, not just a hat, but a full body Tigger. That was quick that you did that. So for the I, for the listeners that aren't viewing, they might be lucky. <laughs> yeah. But they're going to yeah. have to find now. They're going to have to go online and and watch this because um, this is this is can't miss um, viewing right here. This is good, yeah. but there's really a story behind why Tigger is your favorite, and that's what I wanted you to kind of tell. It's it's actually yeah. Cool. I loved I I love Tigger. He happens to be you know he's. He's the same age as, as myself. And for the longest time, um, I've been saying I'm going to get a tattoo of Tigger, um, which I haven't done yet. But uh, one of the one of the boys that was in my son's uh, scout troop, he's an amazing artist. And he drew Tigger as a firefighter. And I keep saying at some point I'm going to get that on me because it looks, you know, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't look like a childish one. It's pretty cool. But, um, yeah, Tigger's, Tigger's cool, man, right, as you know. Because he's your, so that was one of our topics once that we, we, when we were talking, um, right before he put me in a headlock, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was that we, how how we both like uh, how we both like Tigger. So that was remarkable how fast you put that costume on. By the way, I had it waiting. I had I had to get it out of the the, uh, the closet and uh, and and set it up. I've been waiting for like an hour to just put this on. You know. <laughs> So that that's a special treat for the for the viewers that stayed on till the you know till late in the show. That's a special treat for them, right? You if never they would have yeah, five you, minutes, they would have never known about Tigger. We're just trying to get some of those YouTube views up a little bit, and I, I just uh, you know had to had to play with you a little bit there because uh, it, it is something that we found in common. But you know what? It's funny. Your your last thing was, hey, take something, learn something from from every person, and who knows where conversations can lead. And, and, you know, I think one of the things you touched on in the book was mental health and, and we didn't really touch too much on it, but we, we have to remember that we don't know what everybody else is going through. And if you treat people with respect, if you, um, you know, take interest in them and as you say, empower them, you'll learn more about them and you'll get more out of them. And that leads me to my last question. What are the biggest lessons you want people to take from listening to this podcast other than that Tigger is cool? Other than Tigger is cool. So um, is that you could be the best tactician at your job, but if you don't understand the soft skill leadership that's necessary, if you don't know how to treat people, if you don't understand the golden rule, all of that stuff matters so much um, that so many people – that have, you know, that those hard skills they're great at, and they lack they they lack this other part, this very important part. You have to be proficient at what you do, but if you really truly want to um, bring people to the next level, you need to have both hard skill and soft skill um, as part of your repertoire for leadership. And I think it's probably the greatest takeaway of the book. Um, and of this podcast as well, is that those other things all matter. You have to be, you have to have um, skill and competency. And once you have that, we spend a lot of time on mastering our craft, which we need to do. But we don't spend as much time on some of these other leadership traits. And recently talking to um, uh, some fire department attorneys, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, and he said um, 80 percent of litigation in fire departments is related to soft skills. And I'm thinking, yeah, who's the fire department um, guy who's really known for uh, Kurt, Kurt Verone? Verone? Oh, yes. Yes. Kurt Verone. I was talking to him. And uh, thank you. You bailed me out. He would have been listening. To this, like, really? 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, so he was talking, and um, that's what he that's what he said. I was on a panel discussion with him, and that, and that was what he said. And I'm like, because that, that that's because we don't spend the time on that. But you know, and leadership begins at every rank. We should be thinking about leadership from the moment our new people join the fire department or join whatever organization, because one day that individual is going to be a, a lieutenant, a captain, a chief. Um, they may be chief of department. And if you're in a small department, there's even, a, you know, the chances of, you know, one in 20, maybe that some, that, that member, if you prepare them right, will lead your organization. So it's a career long investment in our people. And we sometimes forget that where we think rank means training or, or additional training or leadership training. And we need, we need to preload, load that in at, uh, to our junior members of the organization because it's a force multiplier for their entire career. Yeah. A lot of times promotion means the hard skills. They know that maybe they can read it in a book, but where they really can make an impact is what you're saying is to master those soft skills, leadership, communication, and just be a genuinely good person and, uh, and, and good things will happen. And chief, I, I can't thank you enough for your support of, of, the program, uh, again, for the fire service, everything you did, congrats on, on the book. And this is a family affair too. Your son has helped out a lot with this. Uh, he was at a couple of conferences. It's always great to see the family involved. And I look forward to many more conversations with you and your next books coming out. I think the, the 30 fires you, everyone should know is going to be a franchise. You're going to be like the fast and furious of the fire service. You're going to have 20 of them, uh, by the time, you know, next 20 years comes on and I'm excited to read each, each and every one of them, but thanks for being you. Thanks for your wisdom. And, uh, I hope people that are listening gathered uh, a lot of good nuggets, which they did from the first episode. And if they haven't listened to that one, they can go back and kind of maybe see how good we've actually gotten Janelle on, on these. And if you are actually just listening to this podcast, you can watch us, which, uh, I would highly encourage. You can see me in a Tigger costume briefly. You can see that on the Fire Rescue One YouTube page. You can also uh, see that on FireRescueOne.com. There's actually some banners now with the Better Every Shift podcast. You can email us, Better Every Shift at FireRescueOne.com. Please rate, review the show. Let us know if we're on something or onto something. From the words of Chief Frank Lieb, master the craft of the job and the craft of the soft skills of the job. Work on leadership communication, and be a good person. Most importantly, make sure you learn something, do something, and share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening, everybody.